I was asked to give this talk, and it's actually um, a variant of one that I developed a while ago. And it's actually more about attitudes towards publishing and doing science rather than about publishing itself. But it's a little bit about the way I think about, you know, when you're ready to publish, what are you going to do? How are you going to think about that? Um, so some of this might be obvious to people, some of it mightn't. There's some questions I'm going to ask people. So let's just see how we go. Right, that works there. That works there. Oh, I've got a lot of it. I love these cartoons. They're really good. Um, it humanizes the process of doing a PhD, which is a horrible process in many ways, but it's wonderful at the same time. All right, so my first question is, um, what is a paper? Someone tell me, what is a paper, a scientific paper? I need audience participation here. <laughs> Hypothesis and results, yeah? That's peer reviewed by the academic. Excellent. Anyone else who's not a speaker? New <laughs> <laughs> knowledge from the bank. Yeah. I'll get a few. Um, abstract intro results discussion method. Um, uh, a person I know in the States used to refer to a paper as requiring figures one, two, three, and four. That's it, get it out. Um, it's a public record of a set of experiments. You can think about it that way. You can think about it as a collection of data and interpretation, um, a description of a new aspect of science. Okay? I like to think about it as a story of discovery. So based on what is known and your data. I'm going to come back to this idea that it's a story because I think that's really important. Okay, so my next question is when should you start thinking about writing your paper? Someone must have an idea. Do you know when to start? Yesterday? <laughs> That's actually a very good answer. Um, it's always yesterday. Anyone else? When you have time. When you have time is not bad. So I've got these ones here. Um, you feel like you've reached some kind of ending. Um, someone says, I think you have enough. Um, the researchers hit a brick wall. Um, you're fed up. Um, you abstract got a talk and people liked it. Um, your supervisor needs to renew the grant. That's common. Um, your scholarship is running out. All of these things are reasons why some people decide that it's time to start writing. Um, I think you start writing before you go into the lab and do your very first experiment. So this is what I'm talking about. This is my attitude towards writing. Writing is not something you do at the end. Writing is something that you do even with and under your research. It supports everything you do, and that's the way you want to think about it. There's no value in your laboratory experiments if you don't intend to publish. No one else knows about it, only you. It can be intensely personally satisfying, but it's not going to help your career, and it's not going to help the planet. Right? So publishing has to be a core part of your activity. Okay, so I think you really want to think about publishing all the time. Right. So why am I saying this? Um, it's never too early to get your ducks in a row. Now, what do I mean by ducks in a row? What I mean is your line of logic. So if you think about any decent paper you've written, you can follow a line of logic from the very start to the very end. Okay? And that line of logic, broadly speaking, is what do we know? What is the gap in what we know? What, how can you fill the gap? Um, how will you, why can you do it, sorry? Why is really important here. How will you fill the gap? Um, and how will that change in what we know? Right? And you should be thinking about those things all the time. That is the basic thing, what your paper looks like, but it's also how your project should look like, right? And if you're thinking about that from the very beginning, it actually forms the way that you do your experiments, the way you think about it. Okay, why would you want to do that? I think it helps to keep the bigger picture in mind. One of the real issues when you're at the bench doing your science, no matter what science it is, it's really easy to get bogged down in the technicals. You know, you've got some method that's not working and you're spending time troubleshooting it. And it's really hard to get back out of that and say, why am I doing all of this? And I think for a lot of people in their PhDs, that point comes, you know, sort of somewhere in the second half of the second year where all of a sudden you realise that a PhD is not like honours, which is just like a rush of adrenaline to the end. Right, you get to this point where it's really easy for everything to start closing in and, you, and it's hard to remember why. So you get your head out of the why and see this big picture again. Okay. I think it's useful because it avoids doing things that are pointless and things that have been done before. Okay. And that's really important. You don't have time to waste. Um, 
It also avoids what I call a kitchen sink experiment. So a kitchen sink experiment is where you do some intervention and then you measure every possible thing you can possibly think about in your system just in case something interesting turns up. In other words, you have zero hypothesis and you're just going to chuck everything at it. And what I've seen with these experiments often is instead of deciding which part of the experiment is most important, you try and do everything, which means that everything gets compromised because frankly you don't have enough time to measure everything because it's just too hard because biology marches on. Okay? And so in the end, you actually don't do a decent experiment about anything. You do an amorphous experiment about a lot of stuff and you get the data and it's not well enough designed so you really know what direction to go anyway. So I want to distinguish that from some of the sort of omics experiments we do a lot in biology now where we're looking at a whole transcriptome or whatever, that can be very well designed. I'm talking about an experiment where you really don't know what you're doing, so you just do something and you chuck everything you can think of. And these are, uh, my experience has been that these are typically a real waste of time. Um, it can also help you choose the right controls. Um, I like to focus on this this um, say my um, one of my mentors at NIH, John Udell, um, it was impossible if you wanted a fast answer. He would never tell you what to do next. You would go and speak to him about your data. You would speak about college basketball in the US. You'd speak about politics. You'd speak about how badly paid postdocs were paid. You'd speak about three other people's projects. And then you'd get to talking about your own data. And you'd come out usually with three more questions. But the question that you always came out is, what is the most exciting thing that can happen? And again, when you're really bogged down in your project that stuff is not working, getting out and seeing the big picture and going, well, what might this mean? Where, where could I go? I think that's really useful. And if you start thinking about, what is the title of that paper I want to write? Right, that's got to be exciting. And I think um, that's helpful. All right, so uh, when do you really start writing your paper? No, I've given you that spiel now. So now, you, now you're going to expect me to say, when, when should I really start? Right? Um, actually, the answer really is now. Um, yesterday is a, probably a better answer. Um, but now is a great one. And um, the, the point I want to make is that uh, we're really good at procrastinating writing. I still procrastinate writing. Come, uh, if being in front of a blank, blank screen is a terrifying prospect to actually get those first words down. So, you know, there's all these things that you can do. Um, when you're a scientist, one of the things I've noticed most um, is this. Um, there's always another experiment you can do. Okay? And, and the best thing about this is a procrastination method is you feel like you're doing the right thing anyway. Right? Don't kid yourself, do the hard yards, get into your writing, because remember, there's no value in what you're doing unless you write it down. Okay. So where should you start in writing a paper? My next question. Where should you start in writing a science paper? Question. Yep. Results. Results, someone says, yep. In tandem with methods. Yeah, results and methods, anyone else? Um, so my answer is, I can to digest that. Um, I say you should start with the abstract. And every time I say that, I get this response. <laughs> right? In fact, I'll come on, come on to this a little bit later. I've had many, many people in my lab present me drafts of paper without an abstract because they think that's what you do at the end to tie it together. And that's started making me think about the fact that that's all the wrong way about. Start with your abstract, right? Why do you start with your abstract? Because it gets your story clear in your head, okay? It helps you focus on what is the essential background? What are your key findings? What do you want to say? A paper, usually you can have one, maybe two messages in a paper, right? Too much and it gets confusing. And are there gaps in your line of logic? Again, I want to come back to this idea that you need to have your thoughts in a straight line, right? And if, if, your, if your line of logic goes to, well, we think we know this, we're going to do that, this is why we're going to do it, but we did that experiment over there, right? that doesn't work, right? You've got to make sure that everything lines up. Does that make sense? And I think getting an abstract down can help you do that. Right, um, everyone starts by making their figures. Right, that's what you were saying with results. Right, um, yeah, so here's my comment. Yeah, sure beats writing. And I think it's another dodge around actually doing the hard yards of the writing because making figures is sort of like doing your experiment. You've been messing with your figures all the time. Um, the point of this figure up here, um, this is how I think about the writing process. 
Um, it's just like a chemical reaction where you have this really large activation energy before you get started. And you've got to get over that activation energy before you really get going into the writing process. Uh, and I still feel the same thing. Um, and there's a whole lot of things you've got to do to do this, but often, um, you know, doing your figures and stuff is part of that process of actually getting your mind settled into doing it. And what you want to try and do is not make, you know, make it a short, sharp spike. You know, you don't want this to be a plateau that lasts for months, right, before you get down and sit down and actually write the words. Because right? as scientists, often it's the words that are hard, right? All right. So, um, everyone starts by making the figures. So, again, I want to come back to this central theme I had. If you're thinking about a paper every time you walk into the lab, right, the way you are preparing your data from every experiment should look like a figure already. Okay? And one of the things that I've noticed time and time again is students who prepare their data for their lab book in a certain way, then they have a lab meeting and they prepare it again for their lab meeting and then they prepare it again for a seminar and then they start over again for the paper. Think about how much time you can save if you think about the end game at the beginning and the papers, the, the figures that you put into your lab book actually look more like figures in a paper already. So you've thought about how you would have to communicate that data, right? And so my, my idea is that you can be much more efficient if you're thinking about how it should look at the start, right? Um, and if your figures are kind of in that way, it's actually more important for you to clarify what your main message is when you get started writing, right? It helps to set where you're going. All right. I'd also like to say that writing an abstract is probably easier than you think, right? So most people in their PhD are going to go to meetings and you have to write an abstract to go to the meeting and you hope you get a talk, right? So you've, you've probably submitted an abstract, right? As long as it's a proper abstract and you've thought about it, well, so you've probably got started already. So that's how I kind of deal with this activation energy with the abstract. You've already got something to tinker with. You don't have to start with a blank page for a lot of people. All right, so. That's my attitude about writing. Now I'm going to do some comments about what I think is important in writing. And I'm going to present um, some of my, my rules. So here's my rule number one. Is everybody familiar with the KISS rule? Right. Keep it simple, stupid, or um, keep it simple, silly, uh, if you want to be more polite. But my supervisor wasn't very polite when I started, and he was very fond of the word stupid. Um, Right, so what do I mean by keep it simple? I think there's a problem for a lot of people when they start to write science, because most of us learn to write, not to write science, we learn to write creatively in high school, right? So you're encouraged to write with flair and interest, um, and in fact in fiction, ambiguity can be really a useful tool, right? You create suspense, you can create all sorts of stuff, but ambiguity is, it's the enemy of science and technical writing. You have to be absolutely clear about what you're saying. Okay? There is no way that the sentence that you write can be read and understood in any other way than what you want to communicate. Okay, so absolute clarity is the most important. All right. And some of this again is informed by the many, many times I've had um, not great comments back from reviewers on my papers. <laughs> okay. Um, for most people. Um, if you've been around a lab long enough when the reviewers come, this, this comment um, comes up all the time. Your supervisor is raging because the reviewers just didn't get it. Why didn't they get it? It's so straightforward, right? So, but often when I've had that horrible emotion, you back away from it for a little bit and you realise that the reason why the reviewers didn't get it um, sometimes is because you're not really being as clear as you should be. So why aren't you being clear? This is often because of assumptions that you're making, that people are inside your head, which they're not, ambiguity in your writing, so sentences that can, you think say one thing but can be read to say something else, you've got too many messages and they're all tangled up, um, and sometimes maybe the experiments aren't explained well enough. So I'm going to go through these one by one quickly. Right. Number one, don't assume that your rationale and your experiments are obvious. They are only obvious, possibly to two people. 
you and your supervisor, and they may not even be obvious to your supervisor, they may not even be obvious to you, quite frankly, right. But here's the list of things to remember that your reviewers and readers actually haven't been to your lab meetings, right? They didn't come out of your lab, they don't know the stuff you know, they haven't been on your journey, right? And they don't know how the story ends. Um, something I'll say later is that they start at the start of the paper and they read till the end. Okay, so you have to remember all of that stuff. And one of the biggest problems with um, people's first drafts that I see is all of the assumptions they make that everyone knows this stuff. Okay, um, and I still get beaten over the head by reviewers occasionally when I assume stuff. Um, particularly if you um, if your audience changes. So for me, one of the issues that I have is that I fit between two disciplines, virology and immunology. So I, sometimes I publish stuff in hardcore virology journals for people who are excited about viruses, sometimes in hardcore immunology journals. Now that's actually two sets of audiences and they have different sets of assumptions about what you can say and what you can't say. So if I'm publishing stuff that's got an immunological angle for virologists, I have to be really careful about the immunology because um, the virologists will have a very low tolerance for jargon and for any of that stuff. And vice versa, there's stuff that, that um, the immunologists don't get about how a virus works. Right. So people don't have the same assumptions, they don't know your models. Um, the really key thing is they don't know why you are doing what you are doing. And the why is often as important as the how. You really need to set up, explain why are you doing this experiment. All right. Less ambiguity, more accuracy. This is an example I actually stole from um, another how to write workshop. But if you write in your paper the majority of the time, okay, this could be 90, 75, or in fact 51% of the time. Right? That's still all accurate. Um, but if you're not using the numbers, your uh, reader might wonder, well, actually, what are you hiding in there? Why didn't you say something sensible? Because it might just be 51%. So, be specific, right? Don't, don't use fuzzy terms. Science is about what is actually happening. Be specific, right? This is about if you've got too much to say, and I've had this question come up with students quite a lot, that they don't know what to put in their paper because they just have so much data and they've got so much they want to say, and so, it, you know, they've started off being clear, but by the time they're halfway through their results, they've lost their way. Okay, so I came up with this idea of how you can strain things down and decide what you want to do. So here's, here's my idea. You make a list of all the details you can think of in your project, absolutely everything, okay? You then rank them in terms of what is really important down to what's kind of like a little extra. And you need to draw a line at some point down the list, and my rule is that you're not allowed to include anything in your paper that's Oops, that's under that line until you have got a complete draft. Once you've got a complete draft, if you want to embellish here and there, you can. But the point is to get from the top to the bottom of the paper and start with a limited set of ideas. Then you don't get messed up. Now the key, of course, is where you draw this line about what stuff is in and out. Right? Now some people are quite good about this because they can go down and make a line under what they consider to be the first non-essential item and it's all good. Right? Some people aren't very good about that because that line creeps down because everything seems important to them, right? So if you still have too much stuff, you've just got to move up and go somewhere arbitrary. Say, okay, I can't write more than about half of this stuff, right? Or take off the bottom third, right? But you just got to do it and you've got to be brutal about it and say, there's too much stuff, I've got to get rid of it or I'm never going to get to the end of my paper. So it's always better to focus on the important stuff first, get a draft, then you can embellish. Right? You can always add stuff later. All right, my last one here is, this is a little bit incomprehensible, but this figure at the top actually took um, several weeks between myself and a postdoc to explain actually what is a very common experiment in a type of immunology to a bunch of virologists who spat the dummy when I tried to submit without, tried to explain what the experiment was in words, they didn't like it. Um, but the reviewers love this picture, believe it or not. I know it's very complicated looking. It's really important to explain what your experimental setup is. And the other thing is to make sure that you understand the difference between what your experiment is and what your methods of readout are. Sometimes those things get confused, right? Because particularly in biology, you can have very complicated ways of reading out, you know, how big is a response? 
how, or whatever, right? And often people focus on the method of that readout. How am I doing that? What, what, what are all the conditions I'm doing in that readout part? But actually the experiment is the intervention that you're doing, right? I've got this living system, I'm poking it in this way, and I'm gonna look this time afterwards, right? That's the core part of what your experiment is, and you've got to explain why you're doing it that way, right? Sometimes the detail of how you're going to exactly do the, well, sometimes you've got to say how you're going to do the poking, right? But your detail about how you're going to know what's happened, um, you need to separate that out to the side, right? Because otherwise people get confused and they think the readout is the experiment, but it's not, okay? The experiment is the biological system and the poke, or the chemical system and the poke, yep. All right, so, um, my rule number two is that structure is really important. Now, I've read papers that look like that, right? All of the essential ingredients are there. You can't argue that, that they're missing anything, right? But it's pretty hard to make a story out of it. And, and in fact, your, your um, readers and your reviewers might make a different story than you, and you don't really want that to happen. So, you know, um, the first step, is to organise things a little bit better. Right? But there's still more than one story that can be made out of all those components. That's still not good enough. What you really need is to put it together. And in a paper, often what you have is all of these bits. And you have to lead your readers and your reviewers from this pile through to what you're making. Right? That's the purpose of explaining what you're doing. right? So that they can see the bits and they can see how you're putting it together and they see the world the way that you see it at the end. You know, whether it's the truck, the car, or the racing car. Does that make sense? And structure is really important for that. Right. So, I'm sure you've all seen this a million times, and this comes down to the line of logic idea too. So, a classic scientific writing structure, which is just repeated over and over again. So, in people's theses, it's repeated over. In, a, in each part of your results, it's repeated over but it's also in the abstract, it's in the whole paper, right? The view in the field is, this is because we know that, however, it does not account for, or it doesn't apply to, or, however, to apply this knowledge, right, so there's a question there, we think that, okay, we can test it by doing this, we did that, we found, then putting our data together with a literature means, right? Okay, and if you follow that structure all the time, even though it might seem a little bit repetitive, it keeps your ideas clear, right? You're saying, where did we start? Why are we doing this? What are we doing? What did we find? What do we now see together? Okay. This one you would have seen as well. This is your general paragraph structure. Everyone gets taught this in high school, right? So the idea is you've got to have a topic sentence at the beginning, you have your supporting sentences in the middle, in the middle and your concluding sentences at the end. Right, now what I want to say about science writing, because I've seen this happen quite a lot too, is you should not confuse your topic sentence with your conclusion or your interpretation. So your topic sentence can be, this area is something that has been explored or whatever. So it's telling your reader what you're going to talk about. You don't say, so, we know blah, right? Because in science, your conclusions always come after your evidence. You don't conclude first and then use your evidence after to support, okay? Um, and it's a bit of a trap that people can fall into when they go back to this high school way of writing. And it's a little bit different than a classic persuasive piece of writing, which doesn't have to be supported in the same way that we do science, where it's okay to make your bold statement at the top, right? And then you happily cherry pick your facts. Okay, we don't do that in science. We build up our picture with all the available evidence. So just remember that. All right, and if you get lost, um, remember, go back to your abstract. Get your face out of that, all that myriad of detail and go, what, what was it that I wanted to say here? What's my main picture? Okay, sometimes you're gonna do that and you'll go back to your abstract and you go, well actually, maybe I didn't have that quite right, I'm gonna to have to tweak it. Okay? I'm not here to tell you that you're gonna write your abstract at the front and it's always gonna work out that way. It's a creative process, this writing business, and sometimes you realise that actually maybe you did get it wrong and you need to tweak it a bit. But that's okay. Um, oh yeah, so it's my gratuitous Jackson Pollock, which I just had to put in. All right, number three. Remember 
This is not a dry, dull piece of description. You are writing a story. Okay. Writing your paper as a story makes it far more compelling. Okay. But the really critical thing to remember, it's not the actual story. So this guy here is Peter Benoit. Um, he wrote um, a monograph and he did a, a series of, of talks called Is the Scientific Paper a Fraud? And it's fantastic stuff to think about and read, right? Now, what he actually said, these are his words, that a scientific paper is a totally misleading narrative of the processes of thought that go into the making of scientific discoveries, right? And this is absolutely true, right? You cannot mistake the chronological journey that you made to get to a discovery with what makes a good, compelling paper. You're going to have to retrospectively put together your story based on the bits that you want to know to tell the reader. And that's okay. Right? The guy got a Nobel Prize. He used the word fraud. We all do it, and it's okay. The point is, you can't say stuff that is not true about the science. Okay, the only thing you're allowed to do is bend your timelines and when you had what thoughts. And frankly, I can never remember when my thoughts came about a project anyway. You know, it evolves over time. Okay, so it's not a chronological accurate story, but remember the story has a shape. And this story guides readers through the data, explains the why. Remember, you've got to tell people why you're doing stuff. A story requires internal consistency. Okay? You can't start your paper in one set of experiments saying that this reagent is important because of this reason, and then three experiments later you say this reagent is important for this completely other reason. Right? You have to be internally consistent. Okay? Um, and even though, as I said before, you've lived all of it, your audience reads from start to finish. So you can't conclude stuff because you happen to know it if you haven't presented that to your reader first. Okay? You've got to make sure that they can follow the story. The other thing is that writing devices like suspense can be really useful to keep a reader engaged. You don't put your punchline for the whole paper with the full mechanism or whatever it is in the first figure, right? You've got to have, you've got to open up the story, but you need to have something. You usually want to finish your paper with a figure that's got, you know, some punch to it. Right? So a little bit of building that up. You know, sometimes you'll have an experiment which is a, a classic straw man experiment. So we had this great hypothesis and we thought, you know, right, so then you lay out the experiments, but it's not that because of all of these reasons. Does that make sense? Okay. Right, so do think about your emerging story with each experiment. So going back to this idea that you think about writing while you're doing your experiment, you should be adjusting the story that is going to be your paper every time you go into the lab or every time you get a significant result. Sometimes you've got to do that. Right. Um, number one, don't, don't get trapped by the emotional attachment that you have to your experiment. That experiment may have taken you six months. It may have made you cry. Right? It may have caused you to break up with your partner because it was so horrible but it may be completely uninterpretable and not related to your story, so you can't put it in your paper, right? And it can be a very, very hard thing to do, to stand back from your data and say, you know, whatever. It, it may even be a beautiful experiment, but if it doesn't fit, you've just got to be really harsh about that stuff. Get it out, put it aside for some other time, right? A couple of notes about dealing with your supervisor or mentor. Um, so I think this is really important. Every, we're all different. One of the worst things about supervisors and mentors, right, is that we're people. Um, we're all human. And just as you have stuff in your life, your supervisor and mentor has stuff in their life, I can tell you. Right. Now, um, you don't even have to read the words, but I used to be, um, I used to be a bit like this. Okay. Everything that ever came to me came back looking like that. And in fact, one of my students um, had that above their desk. Um, and that hurt a little bit because I thought I was actually a decent and kind person. Um, um, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I'm putting that right. If you've been thinking about your paper from the beginning, right, when you're starting to write, get on the front foot. Go into your supervisor and say to them, right, here's my story. This is what I want to think. This is what I want to write. Okay? Bring your ideas. The other thing that's really important to do when you go speak to your supervisor, unless you've got a mind a memory like a steel trap. Bring your notepad, write stuff down. You know, 
because often you know, these conversations go on and whatever. Take some notes. Right, so you need to discuss where you're gonna send it, what's in and what's out. Sometimes your supervisor is very good. Your supervisor is not emotionally involved in your experiments the way you are, so they're gonna brutally say, like, what do you want to put that in there for, right? And, you know, often we don't say it in a very kind way, and maybe we should do better, but listen to that advice, right? It's really useful. Um, I think it's useful to pitch your abstract, um, and then you want to discuss your practicalities, timing, author lists, all those sort of stuff. This bottom one, I think people often forget to do this, but it's actually really useful. What help do you need? Go to your mentor and supervisor and be clear, this is what I'm having trouble with. Um, some students are really good at doing this for me. They come in and say, this is what I want help with, or this is, this is what I'm good at, or whatever. Don't think that your supervisor can read your mind and knows what's going on. And so I want to link this back to here. Um, I stopped using red ink because I was speaking to someone else's student once and they said that um, their supervisor asked them what colour do they want to mark up their manuscripts and stuff with. And they said, please not red because it's really aggressive and I hate it. You know, it makes me feel bad when I read all of that red, no matter what it is. And so I started asking my students the same question and no one likes having this work marked up in red. I mostly use green now. And actually it makes a difference. People are happier. I'm actually not writing much less. Um, I think sometimes the pages still drip, but green is better. Now, if a student came to me and said, I really hate the red pen, they could have done that ages ago. So be bold, have the courage to say to your supervisor, this is how you need to help me. All right, um, what, do, what do, you, would you want? So one thing that I like, when someone tells me they're going to write a paper, I actually want a whole paper. I actually don't want, I mean, I've been given everything. I've been given a, a methods and a results section with no intro, no discussion, no nothing else. I've been given everything except for the title and the abstract. Um, all sorts of things. But to me, if someone says to me, I'm gonna give you a draft of a paper, I actually expect a proper title page, as the journal requires, and all of this stuff, absolutely everything, with some reference to the requirements of the journal. As a supervisor, I don't wanna be reading the figure description from the journal to make sure that people's figures are meeting their requirement. If the person is preparing a draft for me, I expect them to do that. Okay, so um, think about doing everything and think about that small, it's not hard stuff, it just takes time. So do that stuff because I can tell you all supervisors and mentors love it when people take care of the little stuff and then you can talk about the big stuff, right? That's what's important, um, what the story is, all those things. My last couple of slides, um, be kind to yourself. Writing is hard, okay? No one really ever taught any of us to write science, not, not in, a, a, in, a, in a sit down way, right? And science writing is actually an art in itself and it's a part of the creative process of doing science. You absolutely want to do justice to your work and your collaborators and sometimes your lab and sometimes your supervisor you're really always very emotional. I'm still emotionally invested. I have a great idea and the experiments have worked out. I get very invested in that, right? And, and I hate the idea that I'm gonna send it out there and a reviewer's just gonna trash me, right? Um, in a way, you're sticking your neck out. Um, you are gonna get feedback out of this process and it's always gonna be blunt, right? And I think as an emerging writer, you have to find your own voice. And my recommendation for people when they start writing is start with the basics being really clear about what they're writing and really focusing on describing things well and not ambiguously. As you write more and more, you find your particular style, your flair, um, what words can you get, get away with putting in your paper and you know, um, it makes it more interesting to read and nobody, you know, no, nobody minds. I like papers to be interesting. And I think a lot of people do. Um, and there's a sense that scientific papers have to be dry because that's just the way it is. But actually, you can get away with all sorts of stuff. I've got a manuscript at the moment that has the word harbinger in the last sentence. Um, I've got away with publishing a paper that has poster child <laughs> as a technical term, right? Do it, right? And remember, it doesn't matter who you are. Peer review is going to return some of these gems to you. So this is back in 2002. Um, the study does not provide new insights, lead to new concepts, or address any new hypothesis. Ouch. That published paper was published. It has been cited more than 100 times. 
Um, 2007, despite having only a single figure, the manuscript is difficult to follow. Oof. Uh, notice now, 2013. So the review is left with these negative results without any insight. I seem to be bad with insight, don't I? Um, and here's the last one. This is this year, right? I get this stuff this year. The manuscript presents nothing other than an unexplained correlative phenomenon. Right, so it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter. I've published more than 80, probably 90 papers now, and I still get this stuff. And one of the referees said that the paper was completely unclear and they couldn't understand anything. Um, one of the others actually said it was well written. So there's opinion involved as well. But you will get this stuff. You'll get this stuff forever. You just take it, try and work out what they're saying, try and work out if the problem is the science or the writing, and move on. Um, and finally, you should always celebrate when you submit your paper. Okay, often we don't, we just go on and do it. But you've achieved something, you've got to an end, right? It's still a done unit, right? Um, perhaps not when you finish the first figure. Certainly when you submit, you know, it's an end and you should celebrate. You should feel good about it. You know, it's a hard thing that you've done. And that's the end of me. <laughs>